All right, well, uh, we are going to talk about logical fallacies. You guys ready for this? All right, cool. So understanding logical fallacies, the first step in this would be to define logical fallacies. And they are flaws or errors in reasoning that occur when incorrect logic is used to argue a point, making the argument, you guys know this word now, invalid. Does that make sense to everyone? You're presenting an argument, but you have some flaw in that that makes the argument invalid. So question to you guys, why are fallacies important to study? So we don't make them. Yes. I would say there's two reasons, and one of them is that. Them. Yeah, so you won't believe them. Say that a little more verbosely. And this, you won't make them. I like the way you said it. Does that make sense to everyone? We need to study and understand how to make proper arguments and how to not make mistakes, which could be termed fallacies. Uh, biblical motivation, I want us to link always to, to the foundation of what we're doing. Um, an important command we have is that we are to correctly handle the Bible. And if we go about either making or believing fallacies, they can lead to a misinterpretation of scripture. Um, they can result in skewed uh, or interpretations of biblical texts, um, potentially distorting the originally intended message, which generally or always should be our objective to understand the original message. Um, you know, a simple example, and I have, uh, actually, if you can read it here, it says, do not judge or you too will be judged, right? Um, again, cherry-picked idea and message without context that is often done. Okay, so we don't want to cherry-pick scripture to justify, you know, whatever behaviors, perspectives, whatever you're arguing for, we need to correctly understand the message that is being presented. And again, this, this Bible verse, do your best to present yourself as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. That is our goal, to correctly handle the word of truth, and we need to be careful in doing that. And so I think this is going to be a fun example. You guys ready for this? An example. Someone is sharing about the importance of relying on God's word in a Bible study, to which someone else replies, I just took a class on critical thinking, which is all about thinking for yourself. But what I'm hearing you say is that we should just blindly follow the Bible. What fallacies can you spot here? You can see something's wrong here, right? And you, yeah, go ahead. You never necessarily said blindly following the Bible, so that might make it a strong idea. Yeah, so he's misrepresenting what the other person was saying. He's also building himself up to be an authority when perhaps he really isn't. So uh, we're going to get to these as we go through the lecture here, but appeal to authority, right? He's, he's making himself an authority saying, I just took a class all about this. I know all about it. When, eh, that doesn't really qualify him to say anything more special in this case. Um, and again, straw man, distorting someone's uh, statements to making them an easy target to argue against. So we can talk about issues with, with this approach. It can, first of all, lead to misunderstandings or deviation from the intended point. But it can also, you know, in this example, it can create conflict, division, things that are not correct. Um, so he's, he maybe thinks he's trying to, to gently correct someone. But he's completely setting himself up for failure if he is not correctly giving a valid and sound and strong argument. Does that make sense to everyone? So uh, we want to also just motivate some things from scripture. These are similar to verses we saw in the first part of lecture today. Um, he who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him, right? Um, hears doesn't mean just like the sound hits your eardrum, right? But understanding, right? Which we can see here he clearly didn't. Um, and also, the simple believes everything, but the prudent goes, gives thought to his steps. Either we need to be careful not to make logical fallacies, or 
believe logical fallacies. Does that make sense to everyone? I'm trying to make a motivation here from first understanding what this is, then a biblical foundation, and a practical everyday foundation. And this is where it's again gonna be a fun lecture, just giving lots of examples. So everyday examples of fallacies. For example, you need to make a purchase of something. And again, we talked about how advertising is often riddled with fallacies. One here could be cool. You know what salesman says, this is our best selling computer, so it's guaranteed to be the best one for you. <clears throat> What's going on there? Fallacy of competition. Maybe, yeah. Right. So first, going back to what we've already learned, he's presenting it as a deductively true argument. But at best, it's inductively probable. And this, this fallacy we were going to term, he's uh, an appeal to popularity, right? Ad populum would be the Latin, and we're going to get to that. Basically saying, well, everyone's doing it, it must be true. It doesn't make it true. Right? It may make it likely. Um, again, you could have some belief in something. You say, well, everyone thinks this is the way it should be. That doesn't make it true. Right? Again, we're assuming something that maybe is likely is guaranteed, and that's not the case. So we're going to get to more discussion of that. Another um, you know, practical, everyday thing, you're, you're talking with people. Let's say, uh, this is, again, a fun example. Your grandma says, you shouldn't go out in the cold with wet hair, or you'll catch a cold. Right? Um, this is a false cause fallacy. The, the cold does not give you a cold. Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> Elizabeth gives me a look because people in Turkey think that. Um, right? There may be some link to if you aren't warm enough, then you might get sick. But right now, we're, we're assuming something to be concrete when it's not. Another practical situation, social media is full of fallacies, right? Um, a simple uh, one here was uh, an idea I found from Reddit. Uh, debate over, like, healthy diets. One person says, you know, uh, meat diets are obviously best, and the other person says they're terrible and they're going to destroy the environment and you don't even care about animals at all. Um, well, of course, you know, he's, he's saying things that aren't even what the original person was talking about. Um, so this is an example of a straw man fallacy, which we're going to again define, but you know, you're, you're setting up something that is not what the other person was actually saying and making an easy target. Does that make sense to everyone? So these are practical, everyday examples in making purchases, talking with friends and family. Yeah, social media, it's a thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe, um, and then you have to get be more more nuanced in what you mean by that. Um, but again, you know, he's talking about they just want to destroy the environment and don't care about animal welfare, right? Those weren't true as a part of what the the original thing was just saying that a meat based diet is what he thinks is the best idea, right? Okay, um, so motivating again biblically, the simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thoughts thought to his steps. So we need to do that. Uh, to, to start off our discussion of fallacies, I do want to give one uh, description of types of fallacies. And there's two types that are commonly categorized. The first, well, the, the difference is formal versus informal. Is everyone ready for this? So formal fallacies are mistakes in logical structure, usually found in deductive. Now, you guys know these terms, deductive reasoning, where a conclusion is incorrectly derived from the premises. Does that make sense? So um, this would undermine the validity of an argument because it's just not structurally valid. Um, so simple examples, so we'll get to defining some of these things, like a non sequitur fallacy is something where the conclusion does not follow from the premises. You could also have an appeal to probability taking something for granted because it would probably be the case. There really aren't many more examples of formal fallacies. It's basically that doesn't follow. 
clear cut, right? Like you gave the premises, the conclusion doesn't follow. There's not a lot of like nuance to that. There, there may be different, many different uh, examples you could give of a non sequitur fallacy. But there's not much more we can talk about types of fallacies to be aware of and on guard for because it's, it's basically simple, it, it didn't follow. But we need to be interested then in informal fallacies. Errors that occur due to the content of the argument typically involving generalizations, the relevance of the premises, ambiguities in the information presented, or omission of necessary evidence. Most fallacies fall into the categories then of an inductive argument where you are incorrectly understanding the strength or weakness of the argument. Does that make sense? You're presenting it as strong, but it's actually weak because of something you did. Okay, so um, you know this would weaken the argument's credibility and uh, it's just not a good idea. An example, an ad hominem. We're gonna get a lot of Latin in here because that's the way these things are named. Um, I will encourage you guys to study because you're gonna want to know these. Um, and, but also, I don't want you to study for the sake of studying just because you need to learn this, but it is useful to be aware of these, not just for this class, but for life in general. So ad hominem, uh, attacking the character of the person making the argument ag against them instead of the argument itself, right? So this is poor argumentation, where instead of dialoguing with the actual topic, you're just attacking the person. Okay, so a statement that I already sort of made, most fallacies that get categorized are informal type fallacies, right? Something where you're not correctly engaging or presenting the argument. Um, they're non sequitur, you can have an appeal to probability. These are things that are formal fallacies where you're just simply that doesn't follow. But we want to be aware of a lot of things that are informal fallacies. Has everyone got that so far? So we've talked about what fallacies are, why, um, why they are important to study in, from a biblical standpoint, from a practical standpoint, two different types of categorizing fallacies. The way I've categorized fallacies um, for this lecture is not something that I've seen others do, but I think is an incredibly useful way to categorize fallacies, and actually sort of neatly divides into two categories relatively evenly. Um, the two that I've defined here are personal confusion and then purposefully decept deceptive. So a lot of fallacies, you didn't intend to deceive or mislead someone but you sort of did because you didn't correctly go about what you were trying to say or you yourself didn't understand. So misinformation versus disinformation. Yeah, good connection. Does that make sense to everyone? But some definitely are purposeful. Um, and I'm gonna break down our fallacies into, I think, at least pretty good boundaries between those. Some might blur that or be nuanced in the use case, but I hope this is useful to you guys. But that aside, I just want to walk through, we're going to walk through 12 fallacies that I want you guys to know and understand and give examples of those and then you guys will have practice and the homework, it's going to be fun. Um, and then I'll briefly go over about another uh, 11 or 12 that you just should be aware of the idea and can reference back to the slides but maybe don't have to remember as much about other than they exist. Everyone got that? So we're going to go through, uh, I think it's six of each of personal confusion or purposefully deceptive and then uh, look at a few more just to be aware of, and then a couple thoughts on avoiding fallacies for the rest of this lecture. Okay, so first type of personal confusion, something called post hoc ergo propter hoc. <laughs> That's tough, right? Um, if you want to remember post hoc, post hoc ergo, that's gonna be cool. It literally is just Latin for after this, therefore because of this. Okay, it is a fallacy, a logical fallacy that includes that since event B followed A, event A must have caused mm -hmm. event B. Does that make sense? I have a simple picture, I don't know what it's trying to convey, maybe like the rainstorm followed the sunshine, hence the sunshine caused the rainstorm. Well, no, of course not, right? 
Just because it follows doesn't mean that it caused it. Okay, so examples. Every time the rooster crows, the sun comes up. That rooster must be very powerful and important, right? Amusing, right? Hopefully you guys are getting the picture there. Another example. My computer crashed after I installed a new piece of software. I'm sure that software caused it. People say that. People believe that. That doesn't make it true. It could be true, but if you present it as absolutely true, you have committed a post hoc fallacy. Does that make sense? With each of these, I want to ask you guys for an example. Um, so this is the first one I get to ask you guys about. What is an example of a post hoc fallacy? Elena, can you think of one? No. No. OK. I went outside with wet hair, and then like a week later, I got sick, and so the, the wet hair made me look like Sure. That's great. Of course, not true, but it might be something that someone would believe, right? Let's see, Sam, can you come up with an idea? Um, we won the Super Bowl, and I was wearing my special hat. Yep. Mm. If I wear my special hat this year, we'll win. Yep, yep. <laughs> so after this, then this, it didn't cause it, right? Post hoc fallacy. This is where I get to tell you guys that in the homework, you guys are going to be, first of all, looking at examples and simply labeling that. Should be straightforward, just an easy way to review. And then a fun uh, set of problems that you have is to come up with examples similar to those and label them. So you guys will have fun doing that. One more example I wanted to give that I want to be careful in presenting because I don't want to mislead someone, but I do think it's important to be aware of. Sometimes people say that I prayed for my friend to get better, and they, they were way better the next day. My prayer must have caused that, right? God is sovereign and caused that, but your prayer is not what caused that. Does that make sense? We should still pray. That's why I said I wanted to be careful. I don't want to confuse you. But I want to give you guys examples of these that might help you to understand mistakes in logical reasoning, right? There could be lots of other examples, but I wanted to give you guys that example. OK, another fallacy, appeal to authority. So definition here. When an assertion is deemed true based on the authority of the person asserting it rather than the merit of the argument or evidence presented. I talked uh, in the previous part of lecture today, if you know, I was saying this is the best class ever, some esteemed guy said it wasn't. If you believe them just because of that, that isn't a valid conclusion. There might be some weight to it as part of an argument, but if you assume it must be true because of that, then you've got a problem. Um, so the authority in, the, in this fallacy often is not even an expert in that, right? Um, sometimes, you know, I'm going to give a couple examples, but, you know, your dad says it's the best ever, hence it must be. He might not know anything about it, but you believe he knows everything, right? You guys should love your dads, but, like, <laughs> it's a good example. Or, you know, uh, probably more common in today's culture, that celebrity says it's the best ever, and you saw them, you know, in the Super Bowl ad talking about it, it must be the best, right? Well, no, they likely aren't an expert, and even if they are, that doesn't prove the validity of the argument. Yeah? Have you seen that, like an online video of like these little kids arguing over the rain? It's so, like a little girl says, my mom says it's drizzling, and then the boy says, no, my mom says it's raining, and they're arguing, and like they're getting very passionate about it, and uh, it's adorable. That's amusing. I like it. OK, so I'll give you guys a couple examples. Um, you know, I said something like, my dad says he's the best baseball player, so he's definitely the best, right? Well, I mean, maybe your dad knows something about baseball, but that you might want to get a little deeper about analyzing something about his performance as a player rather than just saying your dad says he's the best. Yeah? But what about the argument, like, my dad could beat up your dad? Uh-huh, yeah, that's, again, uh, not going to get very far in a logical argument. That's more of an arguing. OK, um, another simple example. You know, This is obviously the best workout routine, because it's what Tom Brady does, right? Um, maybe that means it's a good idea. Does it make it the best? I don't know. Um, what, what kind of examples can you guys think of? 
Like yeah. Boxes. The, what was that? Like cereal boxes. Okay, and what about them? They have like always the sports like gymnastics. Sure. Like crisp cereal to eat. Yeah. Just getting some uh, celebrity to endorse it doesn't make it any better. Yeah. Sure, yeah. You're saying he must be amazing, and this is the way he does it, hence it must be the best. I also want to give you guys an example, again, that someone could be an expert at some level, but if that's all you're going off of, then you're, you're having this appeal to authority fallacy. A simple example that I thought was interesting to include, you know, if you said, well, this is clearly the best way to interpret this because it's what John Piper says is true. John Piper's awesome, right? Josh looks stunned and, and uh, dis dis dismayed. But if, if my entire argument was that he says it's the way it should be, hence it must be, right? <laughs> maybe, but maybe not, right? Um, it could be part of an argument, but if that's what you're going off of, you may be uh, committing an appeal to authority fallacy. Does that make sense to everyone? So you want to be careful with this. Um, so, but again, these are ones that are personal confusion. I want to say that these typically don't have malicious intent. Um, you might just be saying, well, he says it's the best ever. Well, I don't know. You, you aren't probably trying to deceive someone. You could be, though. But again, I wanted to understand that. Another that's common in um, personal confusion, argument from ignorance fallacy. So I'm going to define what this means. When one claims that a premise is true only because it has not been proven false or vice versa. Um, it's also called appeal to ignorance. So it uh, claims that it is true, or maybe claims that it is false because it hasn't been proven true, right? That's the vice versa, yeah. Uh, no, that, we'll get to that. That's about the conclusion. This is about a premise. So we'll get back to your question when we get there. But does everyone make sense of this? We're presenting a logical argument and you say that something is true as one of your premises. And someone else says, well, I mean, I don't think that's true. And you say, oh, yeah, prove it wrong. It's like, well, OK, but you need to prove it true for your argument to hold, not me to prove it false. And at some level, there may be uh, each of you needing to put some effort toward that. Uh, but you know, a simple example, no one has proven that ghosts do not exist. Therefore, they must, they must exist, right? Well, OK. Another example that I wanted to include from uh, application of scripture. Um, so the Bible doesn't explicitly state that, and I said like some modern technological or social thing. I, I gave the example of cloning, right? The Bible doesn't explicitly state that cloning is wrong. So it must be morally acceptable. Now, again. Just because this is a fallacy doesn't mean that the conclusion is false. Actually, that's what my next point here. A fallacy doesn't mean that the conclusion is wrong. It just means that the premises don't necessarily support or guarantee the conclusion. Yeah? Wait, like, are you talking about human cloning or just animal cloning? It doesn't matter, <laughs> right? Like, it could be e either of those. The point that I'm trying to make here is that if my argument was, the Bible doesn't say it's wrong, thus it must be fine. Oh, lots of people do that with lots of stuff. Uh-huh. Now we are getting an argument from ignorance. Yeah. But is it wrong? That will be a discussion for our discussion time. Okay. But again, we would have to analyze it based on, like we did before, here's a Bible verse about this. Here's another like fundamental truth that we can derive from that and then apply to these circumstances. But if instead we just say, well, it doesn't say it's wrong, so it's got to be fine, that's a problem, right? You could just as easily say, well, it doesn't say it's OK, so it's got to be wrong. Well, now where do we go, right? And again, I want to be clear. A fallacy does not mean that the conclusion is false. It just simply means that your argument is not either valid or strong or the best it should be. OK, next one, hasty generalization. And this one is, again, fun. Especially these um, personal confusion ones happen all the time. 
hasty generalization where a conclusion is drawn from a small or insufficiently representative sample of data, leading to overgeneralization and potentially inaccurate or false conclusions. I guess I tried to give a lot of data there to help you understand. OK, so a couple examples. I met a couple of people from New York, and they were rude. People from New York must all be rude. Again, yeah, there's like 20 million people there, and you met two of them. Hasty generalization. It could be true, right? It could be true that New Yorkers are, are rude. That's a general conception. It might be a misconception, though, based on some small subset or data sample. Another uh, example, did you see that group of college students who showed up late? <laughs> yeah, I did. College students are always so irresponsible. Again, we're hastily generalizing. There might be, again, some element of truth to something. But if we take one example and then draw some broad conclusion, we don't have a strong argument. Does that make sense? It'd be similar to us saying, oh, I saw birds flying. I guess this penguin can fly, right? Well, no, right? You're generalizing without proper information. Is everyone tracking with this? So hopefully these make sense when you look at them, but they are very important to pay attention to in real life. Um, can you guys give me any examples here of a hasty generalization fallacy? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, good uh, yeah, example there. If we're automatically assuming that someone is at fault because they have a history of that, we may be generalizing hastily. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, again, we're, we're generalizing based on race. And again, this doesn't mean that, you know, there's a reason why this is a common fallacy, because humans are very prone to do this, and sometimes for good reasons. But we need to be careful when we, if we overstate this, right? You say, you know, did you see that those people were rude from New York? Ah, I don't know if I want to go to New York. Maybe I'll find a different place to go to. That's OK, right? But if you then assume all people from New York must be rude, well, now you have a problem, right? Because you're now generalizing to something you believe is absolutely true when you've just had a very limited sample size. Okay, another example, and I want to give some of these interesting applications or challenging examples. Another one here, I tried praying when I was going through a hard time, and I didn't see that it helped, so I don't think prayer works. Well, now our, our last example was, you know, prayer is amazing, I'm amazing, it all did everything, and now we're saying it's, it's nothing because I didn't see it work. We're hastily generalizing from one example and perhaps overly biasing from your experience rather than understanding the truth of the matter. Does that make sense to everyone? So again here, fallacies are mistakes in a logical argument. You're saying this didn't happen for you, hence it must not be true at all. You are probably not correctly analyzing what happened for you, and you're certainly overly generalizing to something trying to draw a conclusion that you can't. Everyone make sense of this? So some of these, uh, these personal confusion fallacies are similar but need to be categorized differently so you can be aware of them, either to not make them or to not fall for them. Another really interesting one, no true Scotsman fallacy. We get English instead of Latin here, although it's uh, not entirely clear what it means. So let's give a definition. Uh, it occurs when one dismisses counterexamples to a, a broad universal claim by modifying the claim to exclude the counterexample. Let's give some examples to help us understand this. Um, and just to, to reiterate, it is often used to dismiss or delegitimize instances that contradict your belief or assertion without any basis. You just believe it's true, hence it must be true. Um, so here's, here's the example that we get of no true Scotsman. No true Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge. I don't know why we talk about that. Someone must have. Um, and then this counterexample. Is everyone tracking so far? I make a statement, a broad generalization, and that's, you know, 
no one who is this is this way. And then the counter example, but my uncle is a Scotsman and he puts sugar on his porridge. To which the reply, but no true Scotsman does this. Hence he must not be, right? You're dismissing the counter example based on your universal claim of assuming that it must be true. I'll give another example. No true Christian would struggle with doubt. You say, well, but I'm a Christian and I, I'm struggling with doubt. You're like, well, but no true Christian struggles with doubt. You're committing a fallacy here of assuming the conclusion. Yeah. Neither of those examples modify the, the uh, claim. In your definition, it says to a universal claim that modifies the claim. Ah, true. Um, the modifying the claim. Yeah, so the claim is, you know, that no one does this, and then I guess just saying it again. So maybe well, modifying like adding, isn't the best word. Well, I guess true would be the sort of adding factor. Yes. Of, like, here's the general thing. Of what, well, well, wait, no, no, no. And, like, a true one. Like, this more specific. Yeah. Like, you're kind of modifying it and saying, no, it's really like this. Yeah, that is what we see here. Um, so thank you for that, Amy. Does that make sense, Josh? So you're just making a claim, and then you just say no true. Again, this is pretty specific, but it does happen, right? Uh, you could say, well, no one does this, and it goes well. So, well, it did for me. Well, no one actually has this to happen. You're like, well, but it, it, you know, you're just dismissing it without accepting any counterexample. So it. It rejects any counterexample by definition mm -hmm. instead of by logical argumentation. Does that make sense? You set up the definition of the words to prove your point instead of engaging with someone to try to get to the truth of something. Does that make sense to everyone? Definitions are definitely important. And that leads us to our next fallacy, uh, false equivocation. It's a fun word, and we can define this here. When a word or phrase is used ambiguously with two or more different meanings in an attempt to mislead or make an argument seem more valid than it is. I say more valid. To be more precise with our last uh, lecture, we could have said stronger than it is. Yeah. It's blurring. This is the last one, right? Um, so this, I think, is still often personal confusion, right? People will state this, and they don't know what they're saying. They'll, so I'll give an example. The law states that you should not kill. So you should become vegetarian and not kill animals. Well, again, kill might not be exactly what that means. It could mean not killing animals, but really, Murder is more specific to what the law is talking about, and hence we don't have to all become vegetarians. Right? But if this, this could be someone's argument, right? Saying it's wrong to kill. Maybe that's even just a better way of saying that. It's wrong to kill. So you have to become vegetarian. There are people who argue that. Um, another interesting example evolution teaches survival of the fittest. So we shouldn't help the poor. And it's just natural for them, to, for the weak to perish. Well, again, we're, we're misapplying something where this isn't entirely clear what we're talking about. Survival of the fittest is like a macro level thing that we do observe. Or should we come together and help each other, especially because the Bible tells us we should. Another interesting example, um, faith is believing in things unseen. So you just have to have faith that it's the right idea, even if you don't see the reason. Well, again, right, this, especially this final point, is, is just added on based on the confusion that we've drawn, right? It's defining one aspect of faith, saying that you don't see it, but then saying 
but you don't see a lot of things, and so you just have to believe those things too. That doesn't follow, right? Because now you've taken one thing that means something and taken the whole scope of what that could mean and tried to apply it to that. Does this make sense to everyone? A similar example could be that idea of, you know, if you go out in the cold, you're gonna get a cold. Well, no, that's, that's not what that means, right? Those are different ideas. And so this is often just personal confusion where you think something means something and you don't and it doesn't, but it could also certainly be uh, purposefully used to confuse or deceive others. And that's where we get to our second category of fallacies. So we've talked about six fallacies. And again, these are things I want you to go back and study and do the homework on and understand. I don't expect you to always remember all these terms for the rest of your life, but you do need to study them and be aware of them. And not just be aware of these terms, but the examples that they can give in practical application. OK, so first one here on purposefully deceptive. Um, ad hominem. So we already talked about this briefly earlier. It's a logical fallacy where the argument is directed against a person rather than the position they are maintaining or the, the argument that they are making. So a simple example, how can you trust that candidate's economic policy, whatever policy? They've never run a business and have no experience in finance. You can almost see how that makes sense, right? And it might be slightly relevant. But it has nothing to do with the policy, right? If the purpose is to come to the truth of whether that is a good policy, whether or not that person has other related experience really doesn't matter. But you can see how this happens all the time. Another interesting example, I don't think uh, he's a very good Christian. I mean, he didn't do very well on that Bible college quiz. <laughs> right? This doesn't follow. You're attacking the, the individual, not the actual information or results of what you're trying to discuss. Um, another interesting example, you know, why should, you, you sh why should I listen to him about parenting advice? He doesn't even have any kids, right? Again, you can see that these are things that come naturally to our mind and have some weight but we can very easily overemphasize each one of these things that become logical fallacies. Again, someone who isn't a parent might have great parenting advice. If it, the objective is to come to whether this is good advice, attacking their credentialing doesn't necessarily hold much or any weight. Does that make sense to everyone? So this is something we are very prone to do, and perhaps even do um, the, as personal confusion, but it does directly attack someone is their, in their character. Okay, a red herring fallacy is our next one. And you guys probably have heard this term countless places and might know what it means, but it's important to, to understand and give examples. Um, so it's when an irrelevant topic is introduced to divert attention from the original issue leading the argument astray. So I tried looking up where this comes from. It's from some like reporter in the 1800s who made a comment and it stuck as an idea and that's why we call it a red herring. You guys can remember that or not, doesn't really matter, but uh, it, you do need to know the term because it's a very common term. And it's a very common logical fallacy. So uh, an example, uh, you know, someone might say, I know you don't want me to be out late, but I was going to bring you back some ice cream. Don't you love ice cream? <laughs> right? Okay, now we're distracting from the issue. Um, and again, right, this might be very convincing. Fallacies can be convincing, but that doesn't make them valid in understanding whether, you know, someone should be out late and whether that's good for them. Uh, another perhaps even more common place you find fallacies is in polit or red herring fallacies in politics. Uh, someone might say, the crime in this city has in fact increased lately. However, let's consider that the weather has changed as well. Things change over time. Sometimes they are linked, sometimes they are not, but only time will tell. It's all, that's a perfect like political response. It's complete nonsense, right? 
Um, the point was trying to make, you know, that I don't think that crime is linked to whatever my policy is or something, and that, you know, maybe it's not. But he's, you know, completely throwing in something else to distract us from the main issue. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, another even very clear example, again, we're trying to give biblical examples. I know the Bible says this is wrong, but you know, there were a lot of things that people thought were wrong for a long time that aren't actually condemned in the Bible. I don't know if you guys have heard people say something like that, but you can see it's ridiculous, right? It doesn't even refute the issue. It just tries to distract from it. Okay, so red herring fallacies. Uh, next one we have here, straw man fallacy. So we've talked about this a few times already. Um, so hopefully you guys are getting the picture, but it's misrepresenting or exaggerating an opponent's argument to make it easier to attack and refute. That misrepresenting or exaggerating is the key. And then of course, with the objective to easily attack or refute it. So I can give you guys a couple examples here. Um, one politician says, providing Medicare for all citizens would be costly and a danger to the free market. That's his analysis. The other says, you don't care if people die from not having health care. Well, that wasn't part of the discussion, right? He's misrepresenting and exaggerating the other person's claim. Another uh, fun practical example here. A husband says, I'd rather have a dog than a cat. Okay. Wife says, why do you hate cats? <laughs> he didn't say that, right? But you can see how easy these things are to happen in politics, in everyday life, in thinking about Anchor Bible College. I think that Anchor Bible College classes are an amazing way to learn about the Bible. Someone else says, well, you didn't do a great job in that quiz, so I'm not so sure about that, <laughs> right? Again, setting up something to represent it and easily attacking that instead of the, the, idea, the main idea. So straw man fallacy is something that is pretty easy to spot, but also pretty easy to happen. Okay, slippery slope fallacy. And this one is interesting, and I'm gonna, try to be nuanced in it, but we wanted to find it first. Arguing that a relatively small first step inevitably leads to a chain of related events without providing evidence that the events are causally linked. That last phrasing is important. There could be a situation where taking one step leads to another, and that's a valid argument. But it's also very possible that there's a situation where there is no causal link, but you've assumed it. So it's without pre presenting evidence that links these. So some examples. If you start skipping breakfast, it will soon lead to skipping other meals and give you malnutrition and eventually severe health issues. The first one here is intended to be ridiculous, right? But you can see, see the idea, right? If you start doing this, it'll lead to more and life will be terrible. Perhaps a more common thing that gets argued about a lot in uh, our modern culture or society, if we place restrictions on fishing, say to preserve marine life, it will lead to extensive regulation of all human activity, lose individual freedoms, and a totalitarian regime controlling everything in our lives. Uh-huh. You can see the issue here, right? There's no causal link presented. There may be some further discussion you could give to try to make that linked. You could do that too here, right? You know, saying, why are you skipping breakfast? Well, because you uh, aren't eating anything and you don't, you've got an issue. But no, right? Like, you can't just assume that from this. Yeah? Wait, wait, but so, um, like, for a slippery slope, like, what about, and, like, there were, you know, there were people, uh, mostly Christians, who were arguing that, listen, if we uh, legalize gay marriage, then eventually that will lead polyamorous marriage, and after that will lead to other things and everything, arguing that it's a slippery slope if you start changing the definition. Yeah, so you need to be, if, if that is a valid argument, there needs to be a causal link demonstrated between those steps. Just saying, if this happens, then all this will happen without evidence is 
committing a slippery slope fallacy. And because we're used to things where if one thing happens, it can lead to a chain of events, we are apt to believe something even if there isn't evidence for that causal linkage. So I think it's an important distinction there. So yeah. are all slippery slope fallacies, the purposefully deceptive fallacies, Yeah. I just, I don't see how it's falling under that category. Sure, so if I'm telling you that if uh, we place these restrictions, then it'll lead to all of this, maybe I believe it. Uh, but it's usually something that someone presents as something that uh, is trying to convince someone of something where they don't actually believe all that will happen, but you're trying to appeal to their emotion, get them worked up, and give them this idea to motivate them. Okay. And again, I did say that this isn't a perfect divide of all of these, um, but hopefully some of them were clear where some of them you're just personally confused where, you know, if this happened, then that happened. You're not really trying to deceive anyone, but if you set up a straw man or if you're giving a slippery slope and trying to convince someone some way, you're probably trying to convince them something that isn't, that is purposely deceptive. Yeah? What about when we're arguing about like the worst case scenario? Sure. Like, like uh, back in 2022 during the Prop 3 debate, uh, like we were arguing that people should vote no because of all these horrible things that can happen which will not yet happen. Mm -hmm. Because this, this, that was like the worst case scenario. Yeah. Would that count as a slippery slope fallacy? It very well could if there wasn't evidence to, to link that causal chain of events. Um, and I, I don't want it to be disparaging of folks trying to help convince people to be pro-life, but it can be easy to uh, commit a slippery slope fallacy to try to get people worked up about something without presenting evidence to support that. Joshua? Sure, yeah. One, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, the, they're completely right, and that's, or, that's right, but that's why it's so important that we need to learn about this. Yes. Because then if we're going to commit fallacies while we're trying to argue something that is good and true, mm -hmm. people can say, no, and that stuff won't actually follow, and then we go, uh, and then we yes. misrepresented the truth and made it seem more wrong than it is, and that's why it's so important that we understand these things. Yeah. That was well said. Everyone catch that? Mm -hmm. Cool. Another example that I think is similar uh, or very related to what you just said in, in application, a biblical connection. Someone might say, well, if you interpret that passage metaphorically instead of literally, then I'm afraid you'll end up questioning the truth of the entire Bible and soon lose your entire faith. Again, there could be a situation where this follows, but you would need evidence to support that. And to just assume this without evidence could be uh, very easily following a slippery slope. Does that make sense? So these are things that we are very prone to do because in, we as human nature uh, are prone to make assumptions at, to try to easily come to conclusions. But we need to be careful with that in something like this. Okay, a uh, couple more here that we're gonna walk through. Begging the question fallacy. So this is coming back to what uh, Joshua, you said before. So when an argument's premises assume the truth of the conclusion, often, often in an indirect way that conceals that fact, right? I could say the sky is blue because the sky is blue, but you're gonna be like, okay, that's circular reasoning, we're not getting anywhere. And it's begging the question, but perhaps better examples are things like, well, freedom of speech is important because people have a right to express themselves. Well, okay, but like freedom of speech means a right to express yourself. It doesn't, there, there's no argument there. It's begging the question. But you can see how that might seem convincing because it slightly conceals that. But it's important to be aware of this kind of fallacy. Another example, the death penalty is justified because it's morally right to kill people who have killed someone else. Again, it almost seems convincing especially if you agree with it. <laughs> you know, agreeing with, well, both the premise and the conclusion, because they're the same thing. Yeah. That would be, yep. 
And again, a biblical connection that uh, is very common. My interpretation of the passage is correct because it's exactly what the verses are saying. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Just read it and you'll, it says exactly that, right? This is begging the question, right? You are assuming the, you know, the conclusion in the premise. Okay, uh, last main one we're going to talk about before we go over a few smaller uh, details, false dilemma fallacy. Um, so false dilemma where only limited or binary choices are presented when more exist, uh, incorrectly simplifying the issue to an either or choice. We must make pizza. Yes, we must make pizza or it's either pizza or tacos and that's it, right? When you could have, I don't know, enchiladas and that'd be wonderful. Okay. Uh, examples, you either adhere to this strict diet, only pizza, right, or you'll never be healthy, right? Those are the two options. Or, oh, I didn't give you guys the example. Those would be the two options, um, or maybe not, right? Uh, another, if you don't support this effort for compostable containers, then I don't think you care about the environment, right? Those are the two options. Either you support this or you don't care. Maybe you do care, and there's a better option, and there's more to it all. But right, this is a false dilemma fallacy. Um, another one that I won't read all of what I have here, but you know, biblical connection. The Pharisees often tried to trap Jesus, and he used ways to they they presented false dilemmas, and he was able to provide a third option to help them understand the truth. Okay, so those are the main fallacies that I want you guys to study and remember. Um, these other ones I want you to simply be aware of. Um, some of them overlap. They start to overlap. Even you saw that some of the ones we already covered could, you know, how you categorize them, understand them, could overlap. But these ones are interesting. Okay, so a false cause fallacy. So it's kind of like the post hoc fallacy, right? Um, misattributing the cause of an event or outcome to a correlation rather than an actual causation. And I have a... A picture here, which is a little hard to see with the light, but um, it's funny. <laughs> okay, uh, bandwagon fallacy, um, ad populum. So we mentioned this, I think, at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, concluding that a belief is true or false based on its popularity and the number of people who hold that. So I have a picture here of like a, a political rally. It's like, well, everyone thinks this way, it's got to be true. Everyone says this is the best way, it must be. Another uh, one that people often uh, think, appeal to nature, arguing that because something is natural, it is therefore valid, justified, or ideal. Yeah? So uh, that would be a, a no on natural law then? Uh, it would be a nuanced discussion on that. Okay. But if you're defining that just be, I mean, natural law argues a lot about what even is natural. Right, um, so that's what most of the debate centers on. But yeah, uh, you know, I included here just like a Lara bar, which is really just a candy bar, but it it pretends to be healthy, which might be healthier than the alternatives. But you want to understand that just because it's natural doesn't mean it's the best thing ever. Does that make sense? So that would that's the way it's such an argument is often presented. Tu coqu fallacy. Again, we get Latins. Uh, avoiding having to engage with criticism by turning it back to the accuser, essentially saying, you did it too. Um, this happens with siblings a lot. That's why I had this picture, right? It's like, um, you, you did this bad thing. Well, you did it too. It's like, well, it doesn't make what you did right. Um, so this, this happens a lot in, in that kind of setting and in more like professional settings where someone did something then someone else tries to blame them, but then they get dirt dug up on them and all that it gets a mess, right? And we just need to understand it doesn't justify anything. Uh, another common fallacy, appeal to tradition. tradition. Yeah, that's Reb Tevia there. Um, basically saying, if this is the way we've always done it, it must be the right way. Maybe tradition is important, but it doesn't guarantee the truth value of your statement. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, a few more interesting ones to, to go over here. Gambler's fallacy. This 
you could probably see where it comes from, uh, believing that past events affect the probability of future events in situations of, say, chance, expecting, say, a coin flip to be tails because it's been heads five times in a row. Or maybe, I guess, it could be because it's tails five times. You could believe it either way, right? Like, it's, it's due or it's on a streak, right? Like, it doesn't matter, right? And this is very common in just how we perceive the world, right? Well, it happened this way. It's got to be that way again. Well, says what? Okay, appeal to emotion. And this is where you're just basically disregarding logic um, and have an emotional response instead of a compelling argument. Um, she's trying to get out of a ticket was the idea there. Uh, a middle ground fallacy. This is actually a really common thing. It's claiming that a compromise or middle point between two extremes must be the truth. Right? If you say, well, this is, this is what I believe is true, and someone else says, well, I think this is, or you know, so-and-so says this is true, but maybe like something in between is probably more realistic. And we, we go with this because it's often true that there's two extremes and something in the middle is correct. But you can very easily mislead or be misled by presenting two ideas or spectrums and deciding where the middle is and trying to decide that feels like it's right. Yeah. Sure, yeah, that would be a very, yeah, bad, or, you know, good example of middle ground fallacy. Another one we talked about, uh, cherry picking evidence, uh, cherry picking fallacy, so to speak. Suppressing evidence, incomplete evidence, you're only looking at incomplete information, you might have all of those premises that seem like it makes your case strong until you realize that you took out all of the premises that would have made your case weak. So this is an example of like colored glasses of like what you're looking at. A burden of proof fallacy, similar to something we talked about before, is just prove me wrong, right? Asserting that the burden of proof lies with the person making the claim, but someone else has to, um, but with someone else to disprove, right? I don't have to prove this is true, you just have to prove it's true. Uh, sweeping generalization. So this is very common, again, similar to some things with a hasty generalization. In this case, though, it's, it's applying a general rule too broadly. Uh, if you say that you know, this is usually true, hence it's always true. It's like, well, hold on. That's not the way that works. Or you could say, well, it seems like it's usually true. And that's where we got the hasty generalization. It seems like it's always true, hence it's always true. Um, so that's where we get some overlap there. We're running out of time for this lecture because we want to have time to, for prayer. I just have these last couple of thoughts. We want to know how to avoid fallacies, right? We've just talked about them all. That's perhaps the first step, being aware. Um, but one final thing I did want to just let you guys know is that perhaps one final fallacy is something called the fallacy fallacy. When one assumes that a fallacy uh, riddled argument automatically proves the conclusion incorrect. That's what I was trying to... Yeah. <clears throat> Just because there's a fallacy in the argument doesn't mean you can dismiss it. You might want to point that out, reevaluate, but it doesn't make the conclusion incorrect. So the inclusion, argument is invalid, but the conclusion isn't necessarily wrong. So a simple example, uh, an employee says that the company should redesign the whole website, but his argument is riddled with fallacies, all kinds of hasty generalizations and you know, setting up uh, false ideas. So the manager decides, because there's so many fallacies, that it must not be a good idea to do anything that he suggested. Because it, it was, the argument was invalid doesn't mean that it wasn't true. Um, another example, you know, your parents tell you to do something because it's true, and they don't tell you much more of why, right? That's not a good argument. But that doesn't mean that it must be wrong. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's really important to internalize here, that if someone says something, you're like, oh, no, that, that was incorrect. That didn't correctly follow, or they generalized too quickly. That doesn't mean that it's not true. It could, though. You just need to analyze further. So um, final thought was to uh, practical tips for avoiding fallacies. I guess the first was to take this class. 
And the next is what we're building towards wrapping up here, doing the homework. <laughs> Um, perhaps a, a more general tip, though, is just gaining broader knowledge and education. It is easy to mis be misled if you don't know what someone's talking about, don't have the proper context or understanding. So that's important. And again, context. Consider context, both the context of the presenter and the audience, because fallacies can be something you either present or are presented with. And we talked about in the first lecture, ask clarifying questions. That's very important, right? If you think those premises aren't true, maybe it's because you're not defining things the same way. Maybe you're not understanding what the other person is saying. And again, coming back to our biblical motivation, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. We should be different. We should know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I think that's a really good summary of what we've talked about in lecture today. I do have one more side that I think I'll just skip past that was just a recap of these things that we talked about. Um, and you guys can look at that um, to, talk, to think about what's important to study, which leads us to the homework. So you guys, for I know several of you still need to submit the homework for this past week that is due by midnight tonight. So I'll encourage you guys to make sure that happens. Talk to me if you have questions. Then there's a homework due next week that'll be somewhat similar in format. It'll be different. I think there's five, yeah, five sections. Um, you'll recognize argument types, so that you see here um, an example, and then just say whether that was deductive, inductive, abductive. Then you'll uh, decide whether something was sound or valid. And I know those were some confusing examples, and so I want you guys to study that, try to understand that with those examples. We talked about rhetorical devices in the first class or first part of lecture. Um, then we're gonna t you have a whole section on identifying logical fallacies, and then a final fun section on creating examples of logical fallacies um, that hopefully should be fun. Uh, I want you guys to come up with your own ideas. You can look up things to inspire you, but don't just copy something else. And certainly don't copy from the lecture slides, because that would be dumb. Okay, with that, we, we do wanna still have uh, about 23 minutes for our prayer time. So I'm gonna take the guys to the chapel and Elizabeth is going to meet with the girls uh, here.